I keep telling myself I'm not going to do this again. <laughs> I wind up losing so much time putting together videos about artists. And um, frankly, if I didn't have so much love for the uh, Japanese, I might, have <laughs> I, might, I might have just ignored this question. From Saggy, thank you. Thank you for your question, Saggy. <laughs> Um, um, I'll skip the, the um, adoration part, the, the kind things you've said. Uh, the visual order way has changed your life. I appreciate that that is the case. I have a request. You have mentioned before Japanese painting and, the, and their beauty of color. Can you talk more about Japanese painters in your next video? Uh, so, um, the, um, so the... Uh, the reason you hear me talking about them is because the uh, once you get to the place where you realize that sort of the purpose, if you want to put it that way, of uh, of of this as an art form, the uh, the uh, structure of it is the, the 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 without which nothing of our form is is beauty is 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 you know the very defining core of aesthetics. Uh, it has everything to do with color relations and line and all those things in a purely abstract way. And once you realize that, um, the Japanese all of a sudden take this enormous prominence and they rise, rather making the, in the West, which was dominated by storytelling, dominated by illustration, and dominated by realism uh, for the sake of making your, your, your storytelling even more impressive. And um, you can take that as a compliment or a not compliment, but, but when, you, when, you, when, you be, when you're trying to sort out beauty, and trying to find your way through best, the you know trying to trying to trying, trying to choose uh, shall we say your your uh, your your leaders, you inevitably wind up with the Japanese uh, and some key ones in particular. So I'm not going to talk about the whole world of Japanese painting, but there was an era, uh, maybe 80 years earlier or so than uh, Tagawa and those guys, this mid mid 1700s that I that I think all the stuff that I love comes out of. Um, so here, here are the guys. You'll know these people. Uh, you've, everybody's seen at least the uh, the wave down there, and pictures like the Hiroshige on the right bottom. But these are two landscape painters, and um, uh, they um, they uh, uh, are doing something so remarkably aesthetic in terms of line. In terms of there's a there's remarkable beauty to the line and line play. And I, you know, it doesn't mean they aren't doing stuff with mass, uh, as it were. But um, but the but the but the but the sweeping gestures, the waves, for example, uh, you know, they, that we were talked about design in the most recent video, and you'll see that that's that's a case of design. In each of these cases, the um, the play of curves, the play of uh, and the counterplay of counter curves, and and that sort of thing. Yeah, is replayed. These people are just really serious workers in the in the field of, of what makes beauty what, and 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 put, drawing forth the beauty. Uh, you know, even if you're not an impressionist, uh, you still you're still recognizing what's in front of you. You're not manufacturing things. You recognize those things and how they correlate that are already in front of you, as if you're an impressionist. But um, so there's the wave, the Hokusai wave, and then uh, uh, Hiroshige is uh, now Hiroshige is actually. He was born after Degas, but I throw him in anyway because he's, he does he does uh, um, sustain a certain amount of interest, but nowhere near as much as uh, as uh, Yudamaro and uh, Haranobi Haranobu, uh, and, um, and who are very similar to each other, but but the leader of the pack by far to me, and I think the one that was the most had the greatest influence uh, on uh, Western art was uh, Yudamaro, and again born around 1750 or so. So uh, these are samples of their work just to get you started. Uh, what you're going to see right from the beginning, of course, is, is Degas and, 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 uh, and, and certain aspects of Western art. So this should be a little bit fun. I couldn't resist just you know, talking about these guys and showing them comparatively because they're, they're so strong. They hold up, they hold up so well. Um, so uh, this is that world of spot, you know, the dark spot, the, the spotting world we talk about, the value spots. So it's the play. On a, this is a very, these are fairly light pictures, light to, to middle value pictures uh, being, being um, inevitably what they're producing in ink uh, uh, is going to be working mostly with making the darks do interesting things. And don't they fascinatingly do, and don't they really fascinate us with those interesting things they're doing? <laughs> So I don't know even 
which one is more fascinating than the next one? Um, but again, you'll see it. You'll see the mass play of the darks, for example, or the middle tones or whatever they are in those sort of classically amusing ways that you find in Degas as well, uh, eventually. Um, but the, uh, you know, the pure curiosity, if you want to call it that, of something like this, which is just, you know, what we find Degas doing is engaging us with, um, with this kind of curiosity, this oddity. You know, this is the kind of stuff that attracts them across the room. It's, it's amusing to look at. Uh, and when you get there, you'll find it coordinated and, and, and unified in a, in a design way. But it gets you there, it gets you across the room. This is a particularly curious one. <laughs> but yeah, so you can see that all that design work is going on with the curves and the big, big sweeping curves, counter curves, whatever. And, uh, and this, you know, and typically, by the way, these guys are, are asymmetrical in their design. So, uh, and, and again, most of these, I, there may be one or two in here that is not you tomorrow, but these are mostly you tomorrow. And I tried to stick with him uh, most of the way through. I didn't separate it when he's not him, so you just have to, you know, <laughs> uh, not get too annoyed. But um, there shouldn't be much that bothers you about these. I'm showing you this one now. I, I was just talking about asymmetrical pictures. It's very clear that his whole thing is asymmetrical. It's basically, for the most part, is asymmetrical. Even a picture like this, the whole movement of this is across here, and the counter line is this one. So if you're looking at the, um, so if you're looking at the, uh, the, the, the. Uh, uh, Japanese for color, though, this is a remarkable group of pictures. And again, you'll have to find your own uh, resources. This probably isn't going to be the most greatest resource. But the kinds of colors uh, playing in and through this picture, and of course, of course, fundamentally, the first thing they do is they just look like the colors that belong together. They belong in the same scheme. And um, so you see that you know one picture is a higher higher keyed picture and lives on the reds. Another one is living on the greens and is more neutral. And so on, um, and but the color relations, the color, the way colors play, the way the beautifully uh, 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 counter counterplaced, uh, juxtaposed, I guess the right word, uh, uh, purples and and their their reds and their yellow, the ones for this system, and how different they are from the ones for another system. But yeah, just beautiful, beautiful color, um, and some of it like this one, quite complex, surprisingly complex. Uh, so I wanted to show you because of the diagonals. Though I'm, I, I used to be a fan of Kolf, and I'm not. A not I'm not. I really still think he's possibly the best of the of the Dutch uh, landscape painters. By the way, who were painting before a hundred years before these guys before you tomorrow. So don't um, assume that the whole of man sort of was evolving that way, or the whole art world was evolving that way. But these guys are trying to build diagonal pictures repeatedly, repeatedly. Not just him, but Klaas and other different guys, um, and. Uh, uh, but they don't get me the same aesthetic satisfaction by any stretch as these guys do. So, you know, you're, and again, it, this is the realism model, I'm afraid. Uh, and uh, guys would have things put in pictures because if they owned something special, it was really expensive or something or other. That sort of thing that wasn't unusual. It may be a very expensive goblet. And uh, so the, the clause, clause, whoever it was, a cough would have to design that picture for that. Or that thing, but so so frequently I see in the uh, Dutch they they start they, they they have a diagonal picture and then they try to not do diagonal. They try to make a, a big blob in the center as if it were a non-diagonal picture, so they don't sort of live up to their the billing. Um, but the idea of just going from the bottom and out of the picture to the top uh, is is all I mean by asymmetrical. It's not a pyramid centered on the picture like I compare Robert Douglas Hunter so frequently because he lived on that uh, model. And sort of most of Western art, most of Western art is not as, as uh, asymmetrical as these guys, even though it happens from time to time. And I'll show you a really nice example of it happening from time to time. Here's a guy who, if anything, supersedes the, uh, these guys, and he lived before them, and that is, um, and that is Vermeer. Uh, you'll see again, he's doing this out of center thing. You know, he's starting the model off on the side, which is very common for these guys, and then ending the models before he gets to the middle or crossing the middle. Uh, so that again is an asymmetrical move. You know, you're not planting the model in the big, in the middle, and your gestural thing is on this line, and there's the counterline for it. And this one here, the counterline is this one, and there's a bend in this thing, a curve in that main line. But that's asymmetrical designing, right? And so here's that long line, and there's your counterline. That's the game. Um, 
uh, so, but he, as I said, you don't, I, I pick on some of the Dutch, but not all of them. And these guys, I think Kauf and, and, and um, uh, uh, Vermeer were painting at the same time. And so it's quite interesting that the, uh, that the, um, uh, the work, the aesthetics of the work can be so diametrically different. And I think that we're living in a world just like ours in which there's a world that believes in realism as the end all, and the, of course, of course, um, if you read um, if you read Harold Speed, he's talking about how that became this thing. Realism became this thing, and dominated the Western art. And um, and it, and it, and everybody worked harder to get more and more realism, more and more realistic in their treatment. Probably very much evolving from uh, Da Vinci's conversations. And uh, and certain people stayed in the field of aesthetics and uh, let their focus be in on the beautiful. As they say, their focus, their energy, not that either one of them isn't trying to do that on some level. So I'm showing you that Degas because I'm showing you how flat he is. These things could be just prints. And some of them were uh, monotypes or something, which he then did something to. Um, but they have that use of verticals, which is pretty commonplace in a lot of the, uh, in a lot of the uh, uh, Japanese. Um, Asagi, I haven't left yet. I'm still, I've still got more pictures of the Japanese. But I want you to see this, this pattern orientation, right? These are flat looking patterns. Now, when you look close at a Degas, you see form. He's a guy, he's a, he's a brilliant form maker. He's a real draftsman. But, but, he, but he gets the game of pattern, of flat, what, it, what things do when they're thought of as flat. And he keeps a level of flatness through most of his pictures, uh, an element of flatness. And frankly, if you ask me that, I mean, this thing could just simply be a Japanese, a Japanese print. I mean, it's, it, everything about it is in that class. Of, and Degas was, of course, nobody was probably more of a, um, uh, uh, what's, what's the word, a cosmopolitan than Degas. He, he really did think, he, he watched everything everybody was doing and did his best to, uh, to uh, uh, buy in, not, not to copy, but when he saw something impressive and interesting, he, he, he went for it and did work with it, thought it through. So here, even in this part here, you can see in the bottom one, again, looking like a print, you see those darks just become interesting patterns. So much so that that whole picture's design really is just spot patterns, spots, dark spots, one you know, through, a middle, through a middle value and, and light spots through a middle value, doing their curious no tan, if you want to call it that kind of thing. This is early on in his career. But this viewing from the top, from above, um, you don't see a lot of that in Western art. You see it from time to time in, in Tiepolo or somebody, but he's got reasons. But, but this isn't something people did. I think there was a certain norm, a normative thing that uh, kept this away. But I think once you saw Japanese prints, and by the way, these prints would have been around a long time before Degas. Uh, I'm assuming that world trade wasn't any different from what it is today. And I'll show you a reason why, it, why I'm saying that in a, at the end of this. But, um, but, but that's one of those other th one of those things he, he picked up. And he was always looking for innovation, always looking for something to do that was just different, outside the box, so he would get bored easily, I think is the way he would describe it. Here again is this wonderful patterning, distributing of, of curious spots, and in fact, even going out of your way to make curiosity out of patterns, so that things are more curious than they are known to, you know, so you have to look again to say, what is that, you know, what is that thing? <laughs> uh, here again, the, sh the, 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 the hidden, you know, the person hidden behind or the screen, somebody coming from behind, uh, very commonplace in the Japanese print. Uh, but it doesn't mean it's not anywhere else. It's just that that's, it, this, this thing looks like it's self-consciously borrowing from that. Even the nude that he does. Um, and um, uh, like the, here's, a, here's, a, here's a nude, uh, and this uh, is, I don't think this is, uh, I wish I could tell you who this is. Uh, I'm sorry, I've lost it. It's not, I don't think it's uh, um, uh, Udomaro, but you can see that sort of odd shape that he's finding, sort of a, you know, what that stuff that Degas is blamed for doing, kind of deforming women. He's not deforming them, he's just taking funny angles so that the shapes become the irregular things instead of the standard, you know, the ideal or something like that. But the bathing subject, of course, is, you know, he picked on that right away. Of course, it is a natural if somebody really loves the human figure. Um, and the possibilities of the human figure, you know, the, sh the kind of interesting things you can do with the human figure. Um, these guys are getting it, and Degas got it. Um, so that's just most wonderful, most delightful to look at. 
anyway, that's so that's another connection. And uh, uh, you know, and this is as, this is as lovely a piece of design as, as happens. Wonderfully simple, and there it is. Uh, beautiful color scheme. Now here um, we're showing Mary Cassatt doing the the letter and the um, um, and the uh, ablutions. And um, this is clearly looking like it's self-consciously trying to be Japanese painting. It isn't as, t typically there's an elegance in the turn of the head and that sort of thing. There's a certain kind of search for a, I don't know if you want to call it a spiral line, a twisting line, a serpentine line, maybe maybe Hogarth's line of beauty <laughs> that they're doing, which, which Mary Cassatt seems to want no part of. But uh, she's playing the same games and she's staying with big flat patterns and simple shapes and... and um, and doing and curious looking ones, you know, some of this stuff just could be flat out of a book of, of Japanese uh, prints. Uh, and again, uh, 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 the theme, the subject of the uh, of the of the woman in uh, some privacy. And Mary also did this the subject of of, the, of children, and um, she seems to have really relished it. And I'm only showing these to I'm not suggesting that I think she got that from these guys. But there's the same kind of wonderful uh, sense of uh, classical maternal um, uh, affinity for her kids. Sometimes not so maternal <laughs> looking at some of these prints. But again, each one a beautiful design and uh, each one of them beautifully colored. Um, and uh, so here's Mary Cassatt doing a print. And again, that use of the um, patterned, the patterned drapery. That stuff does look like it's coming significantly out of, you know, finding that kind of stuff in... Um, and uh, in the in the in the in the Japanese, if I can get my this to go back once, yeah, you can see him doing it here and here. But you see this pattern, 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 spot stuff, uh, and stripes and all sorts of things. You'll notice as we go along. Uh, yeah, and again, you'll see the, uh, the 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 beautiful play of spot. You know, spot, spot, spot. But of course, this is turned. They aren't cut out spots. Typically, the spots in Dutch work is cut out. The only place it's not sort of cut out is when it gets next to a really dark value. But really, what you're seeing is cut out uh, shapes. Um, you may as well think of them as silhouettes or blocks, or it is block, wood block after all. Uh, and um, so, the, so, the, so, the, so the tuning, the turning of form with midtones, the softening of edges with midtones isn't there. But the spotting is still spotting um, the placement of darks in relation to other darks. And the size of them and all those sorts of things is still the game, right? Much like you're seeing here to here to here, this kind of thing. So I'll end with this one and um, uh, express some uh, curious, uh, frustration with myself for having having promoted this one by Whistler as having been influenced by this one by by a uh, Japanese guy who just happens to be born what thirty years after Whistler. <laughs> So I'm going to suggest something, actually, and that is that the print world went back and forth. This print was done in 1911. This guy was born, I want to say, in 1870, where, where Whistler was born the same year, I think, as Degas, 1834 or so. so. So here was a print that came out in 1911 when this guy was maybe 40, whatever age I said he was. I mean, whatever, whenever he was born. And so it's entirely possible that, that this came from this. And, uh, of course, you could conceivably have seen a print of this in itself, but this print was, uh, I mean, and frankly, the whole bridge and everything just looks totally uh, Japanese, almost to the extent that you wonder if he was over in Japan. So I don't maybe there is a bridge like that in London. I don't know. Uh, in any case. Uh, so, but that's that sort of tonalist thing that you see uh, that's part of the beauty of a lot of, um, a lot of the print world. Just when values are very shallow, and I think that's very strongly suggested. Uh, suggested is it, it's possible that that's what's suggested that to this guy to doing to a lot of other people. It's, it's entirely possible because by the time those guys were uh, certainly doing, uh, by the time these guys are working in their uh, midlife, those prints were everywhere. Screens were everywhere. I mean, the world is full of the Japanese uh, uh, print. So again, beautiful colors, uh, color schemes. Always very, usually very simple in, initially. Big green, red, yellow, if you want to call that the yellow, uh, or whatever that is. Uh, if you want to think of that, that as a combination of things that make up a yellow. It's still basically simple. It's really basic and simple. And it does look like this guy's trying to do, even to guys trying to make this big screen a color X and then finding a beautiful color onto it. 
And of course, to the degree they certain sort of imaginative paintings, uh, you know, that was carte blanche, they could do whatever they wanted. There probably were some serious limits with the colors they could use and the effects they could be color effects. But, you know, when you look at some of these earlier ones, it doesn't really look like they had much of a problem getting, um, getting a variety of colors. I don't know why my computer's acting a little slow, but um, let's just go back to these couple color ones, like this one down here. There's, there's a fair variety of colors in this one. And, uh, and so there is in the um, color group ones, there's a lot of different colors in here. So they, 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 had a, they, could, they could make themselves a feast and it'd be varied all over the place. But uh, those are the kinds of thoughts that come to me, saggy. And, um, you know, if you actually, in the future, if people want me to talk about something, I, might, I recommend you might send, uh, you know, maybe a half a dozen or a dozen of the very best of that person you want me to talk about and save me a whole lot of headache. And by the way, I don't do this with reluctance in that way. But uh, I, I'm pleased to do it for you. But um, uh, I, but it would be better for me, uh, just just in general, if you if you um, talk about the ones, you know, that I know this question came from me saying what I love, so it does matter that I pursue it this way. But it's just in general when you want me to talk about some painter, you know, bring up three or four or five. What do you think are his best paintings and send them off to me? I don't really want to do this, by the way, as a rule of thumb. I'm only reacting, by the way, and it's very important for me to always say this. Just reacting as a painter to these things with my eyes. I'm not trying to tell you what I know about Japanese prints. I don't know much. I, I, I have to do a lot of work just to figure out what dates they were born. <laughs> I like that, that big surprise when I found that the Whistler um, happened probably before the, um, before the other painter did his. I forgot his name, by the way. It seems silly. But, uh, so, but no, it's, everything's about right, reacting with your eyes. So I'm just watching these things, and I know about spotting and distribution of, of, of silhouette effects. And you know the play of, of, of from across the room of pattern, so those kinds of things uh, 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 I just watch these things and see this and see that and so on. Just just feeds out of my background. Anyway, uh, good. Um, so thank you all again for the nice donations, um, and uh, please do comment, um, uh, share, and um, yes, Lynn. What's the other one? Uh, subscribe. And um, yeah, we'll see you next time.